For those of you who are new, we have been in this series for the past couple weeks or so uh, called The Power to Change. Now, we all like the idea of change, but often we don't follow through with change. Uh, Sometimes there are changes we don't like, but we're talking about the power for positive, permanent change, which only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, I'm going to talk to you about this thought, how God uses your weaknesses, how God uses your weaknesses. Now, we don't like to admit weakness. No one does. Heard about two little boys that were arguing about whose dad was the strongest. You know how little boys are. They think their dad's the strongest in the world, and uh, then they become teenagers, and they think he's the worst in the world, right? So, but these two little boys are arguing about their dad, which one was strongest, and one boy said to the other, he said, my dad can beat your dad up. The other boy looked back. He said, so what? My mom can beat my dad up, all right? So we don't like to admit weakness. We don't like to admit that we're not perfect. We don't like to admit that we make mistakes or that we're not strong enough or good enough or smart enough. In fact, did you know that the number one answer, the number one thought that people think about how you go to heaven when you die is by being good, by keeping the Ten Commandments. Did you know that the majority of Americans, according to these surveys that were done, the majority of Americans believe that they're good. They're good. Now, they're probably good compared to some people, all right? We all can find somebody that we're better than. I always find it that people compare to Hitler or whatever. That's a very low bar, all right? Uh, you know, it's not, not a very high standard. But we don't like to admit weakness. Normally, we can see the weaknesses and failures in others, but not ourselves. You ever notice that? We can easily point out or spot somebody else's weakness, somebody else's failure, the way somebody else did something wrong, but we rarely see it in ourselves. Kim and I went to Bible college many years ago. I went to Bible college and then seminary, spent a lot of time and money getting that education. But years ago, we were in Bible college, and uh, while we were in college, uh, we went to school with a young man named Dan. He married a young woman named Denise. He became a pastor of a church in Daytona Beach, Florida. To my knowledge, he's still there. When he was pastoring that church... Uh, He had a boy, which I'm sure is grown now, but he was about four or five years old at the time, and Dan was mowing his grass. Now, for those of you who have had children, you know that kids always want to help as long as it's something that they shouldn't be doing or they can't do. When it's something they can do, like clean their room, they don't want to help at all, right? But this little boy was, as little boys do, was begging his dad to let him help. Daddy, please let me help, let me help, let me help. And Dan was mowing his grass, but this little boy, could, he was too small. He couldn't run the ride mower. He couldn't run any of it. Finally, Dan got sick and tired of the boy begging. So he said to him, he said, fine, you can blow the grass off the sidewalk. And, you know, he had the power equipment there, the blower and all this stuff. And he went one more lap around the house as he was mowing. And when he came around, he saw his little boy on his hands and his knees on the sidewalk. And he was going, (laughs) 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 he was blowing the grass off the sidewalk. Now, you know, we laugh at that and it's kind of funny, but just like this little boy We don't plug into the power source. Did you know that you have the power source, the availability to do what God has called you to do? You may feel like you can't overcome temptation. You can't overcome discouragement. You can't overcome your attitude. There are many things we think we cannot do. But the reason we can't, and I would submit the only reason that we can't, is because we're not plugged into the power And God has made the power available. And until you and I admit our weaknesses, in other words, our need for God, 
we'll be just like that little boy. Ineffective, frustrated, and limited. Now, I wonder how many times have you limited yourself because you didn't admit that you were not strong enough. You said, that's odd. That seems like the opposite. No, no, no. As I'm going to explain to you from Scripture today, it is in our weakness that we are strong. And I'm going to explain what that means to you today. Uh, so in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said this. And, and you know Paul, if you don't know his history, uh, before he became a Christian, he was a terrorist. In fact, he persecuted Christians. He arrested Christians. He helped kill Christians or imprison them. That's what he did. And, and you thought... Uh, that you knew somebody in church that was, you know, just difficult. Think about what that would be like, okay? And, and so the Apostle Paul had this incredible... By the way, everyone who gets saved, that's an incredible miracle, okay? You say, well, I didn't have a, a Damascus Road experience like Paul. That's okay, because God brought dead things to life when you got saved. It was a miracle. And what God does in your life is he wants to change you. Paul, as he was um, been called by God, he got saved, and Paul became the leading apostle, as far as we're concerned, not necessarily in the church at Jerusalem, but across the world. Did you know that literally, and this is actually the truth, you and I would not be in this building today if it were not for the apostle Paul. Paul took the gospel to three continents they did not have the gospel. He was responsible in a very, very real way for the gospel coming to you and to me. And so he knew a lot about it. And here's what he said. And if I think of anyone in the Bible that you would say, this person is strong in their faith, I would think the Apostle Paul, pretty strong. Um, he did miracles. He wrote more books of the New Testament than any other person. I mean, he was, he was something, okay? But I want you to read with me what this man said, and this is an important discovery. It's important to know this about yourself. And in this, and admitting this and trusting this, here's what happens. It becomes a catalyst for change in your life. Remember, we're talking about the power to change. So here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, but he said to me, and he was talking about he was facing what he called a thorn in the flesh. He was facing a challenge. You ever face a challenge? You ever have a barrier? You ever have a problem? You ever have something that you think is too big of a giant for you to overcome? Well, Paul was there. Here's what he said. But he said to me, talking about God, he said, my grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, wait a minute. That seems like the opposite of what is true. His power is made perfect in weakness. We would think, if I was writing this, I'd be like, his power is uh, demonstrated in strength. Okay? Do not pay any attention to the lights. Okay? <laughs> that is God speaking to you. All right? And he is saying, give a love offering at the end of the service today. I'm 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 kidding. But we will take it. If, if we need to turn those off, we can, okay? He said, but my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness. Once again, that's not something that we boast about. But he said, I will boast more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. And then he makes this incredible statement. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now, humans are weak. Can we admit that? Now, some are stronger than others, but we all sin. When it comes to the ultimate weakness, we're not strong enough to be perfect. We just aren't. We fail. Um, we eventually die. I mean, ultimately, the great weakness is that we ultimately die. You're not perfect. We love to say, and I love this about our church, 
that Stillwater's Church is the perfect place for imperfect people to look around. Go ahead and look. All right, you can do that. You can participate. Uh, You don't see anyone in here that's perfect. And you wives, you don't get to say, yeah, I know. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. There's no one who's perfect here. And so this is the perfect place for imperfect people. This points to the importance of fully trusting in Jesus and not our own strength and power. So let me establish a couple concepts before I give you the main truth I want to give you today. Okay, there's a couple concepts that are in this passage. Uh, God is God and you are not. That's sometimes hard to get. But God is God. You say, well, that's duh. Everybody knows that. No, not everybody acts like that. God is God and you're not. That means he is in control and you're not. God is God. Humans are weak because we sin and are imperfect. I've got some bad news for you if you are one of those that thinks that you have no sin or that you can earn your way to heaven. It just doesn't work that way, okay? You say, well, I keep the Ten Commandments. Do you now? Now, I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for a long time. I got saved when I was eight years old. Um, you know, I've broken every commandment. You say, wow, they let you be a pastor and do that? No. Uh, When you understand what Scripture teaches, then you understand that we all sin. And you say, well, I, you know, maybe I have not worshipped God fully. The first four commandments deal with that, by the way. We've all broken those. Uh, We've put things before God. Uh, The fifth commandment being honor your father and mother. Anybody ever been a teenager before? Okay, we've all broken that one. And and then, you know, the following commandments are, they deal with our relationship with mankind, with our neighbor. It says we're not to steal. We say, well, I've never stolen, I've never robbed a bank. You ever cheat on a test? You ever not give God the first tenth? We all steal, okay? You say, well, I've never committed adultery. Well, you know what Jesus said? If you even look at someone to lust after them in your heart, you've already committed adultery. You see, what he's saying is it's the same root sin. It's lust. Okay? Uh, I was telling a guy about this one time, and uh, he, I said, and then there's the commandment of don't murder. And he goes, I've never done that one. And I looked at him. I said, well, I have. He kind of like scooted away from me, you know. And, and well, I've never killed anybody. Do you know what that means that the the root cause is hatred. The root sin is hatred. You ever hate somebody? You ever have somebody do you wrong, and it just, from the pit of your stomach, begins to well up. And for most of us, it spills out of our mouth. But the truth is, we've all had that. And then, you know, the, the 10th commandment, which I think kind of... It's a weird commandment, thou shalt not covet. And I, for years I wondered, God, why in the top ten things that you say, most important things, would you put covet? I would put something in there like, you know, don't do drugs or, you know, whatever. But God said don't covet. Did you know that all the other commandments are rooted in breaking that one commandment? Covet. Why do we not worship God first and foremost? Because we covet power. We covet to be in God's position. We covet our own time. We covet control. Why do we rebel against our parents? Why do we not honor them as young people or even as adults? Because we covet that power. Why do we steal? Because you covet what another person has. Why do we uh, commit adultery? You covet someone else's relationship, someone else's life, someone else's spouse. Why do we kill? We covet someone else's life, what they have. Uh, Why do we lie? Because we covet what someone else has. Every sin springs from that. That's why it's very, very important. Thou shalt not covet. And I'm not preaching about the Ten Commandments, but I do want you to know that what you and I need to understand is we cannot keep the commandments. Now, should you 
Try to keep the commandments, of course. I'm not suggesting you go kill somebody this afternoon. But I am saying that if you're on the basis of your relationship with God, that you think that by being good, by being strong, by being good enough, that that is what God is looking for, you're wrong. You're missing the point. Paul said, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Our strength comes from depending on God. That's one of the core principles here. Paul was not saying that he was strong because of his sin. There are some people that misread this. Oh, I'm just a jerk. You know, when I'm weak, I'm strong. No, that's, that's not what that means. He's not suggesting that he was strong because of his sinful weakness or his sinfulness. Uh, he, he's uh, not saying that he was weak because of sin, but because of who forgives sin, that he's strong. He's not strong because of his failures. He's strong because of his reliance on God, okay? That's where his strength comes from. He's not strong because of his sin, but because of who forgives his sin, who paid for his sin, and who forgot his sin. Aren't you glad that the Bible says that God casts our sin into the sea of forgetfulness? And that's a metaphor of saying that he chooses not to remember it ever, 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 ever again. Now, don't raise your hand, but I wonder how many would admit that you've done something, you've done something wrong, and it keeps on coming up. Maybe there's somebody in your life that keeps reminding you of it. Maybe it's just the devil that keeps reminding you of your failure, but it just keeps popping up and popping up. When you've been forgiven, when you've put it under the blood of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, the only way you can go to heaven is for God to give you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He forgives your sins, and it's called justification. And what he does is he puts Jesus' righteousness on your account, and he takes your sin, your failure and puts it on his. That's the only way you can possibly go to heaven. And you know what that means? That's what it means when God says he remembers our sins no more. And every time you keep bringing your failure up to God, every time your failures repress your progression in your Christian life, God's like, what are you talking about? What, what sin are you talking about? You see, it is when I'm weak that I'm strong. Jesus developed this concept on the, in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if you've read that, but we call the first part of that sermon the Beatitudes. I believe the Sermon on the Mount, which is preached by Jesus, you can read it in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I believe it's the greatest sermon preached in the history of the world. And the very first part of that sermon, we call it the Beatitudes. And you know what the very first words that were recorded in Jesus' sermon for us from Matthew? You know what he recorded? The very first thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, you would think that Jesus would have said, blessed are those who are strong. Blessed are those who endure. But the first line of that is admitting that you need God. That's where your weakness becomes your strength. I'm going to read to you in a couple of other translations so that you can really understand what was being said here. Uh, from God's Word translation, it says, Blessed are those who recognize that they are spiritually helpless. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Remember what Paul said? When I'm weak, I'm strong. In other words, when I admit to God, I'm helpless. Apart from you, apart from depending on you, apart from trusting, apart from you working through me, I'm helpless and hopeless. That is when you're strong. The news translation says this, Happy are those who know they're spiritually poor. The happiest people in the world are those that understand that they're weak in that they cannot do it on their own. They must depend on God. It's not your education. It's not your talent. It's not your strength. It's not your experience that makes all the difference. It's trusting 
in him. That's what makes you strong. Then in the Living Bible, it says, humble men are very fortunate, he told them, for the kingdom of heaven is given to them. When you're humble enough to admit that you're not strong, that you are weak. And then the New Living Translation, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need. And by the way, that, that word poor in the Greek language, and I don't normally do a lot of Greek stuff because you're, you're really, you don't care. Um, but that word means to be utterly broke and broken. It doesn't mean poor like, hey, I'm a little short. Can you loan me five bucks for lunch? That's not what it means. Uh, being poor doesn't mean, hey, I'm behind on my student loans. Can you help me out? That's not what it means. That word poor means abject hopelessness, abject brokenness, abject poverty. Unless someone steps in on my behalf, I have no hope for living. That's what the word poor means. So in other words, when I admit to God, I can't do this on my own. I'm hopeless when it comes to earning your favor. I'm helpless when it comes uh, to earning my way to heaven through my own goodness. And then I love the message. It says, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Do you get it? He says that when... You are weak, you're strong. When I understand God's strength, that's how God uses my weakness. Now, for those of you who come regularly, you know that I do tend to go a long time on my introduction and not as long on my main point. So let me just give you a couple thoughts how God can use your weaknesses. Number one, God uses your weakness to demonstrate his grace. He said in that passage, my grace is sufficient for you. When you trust God, he will demonstrate his grace in your life. You say, well, I don't deserve it. That's kind of the point. Grace is not earned. It's freely given. You don't do anything to deserve it. You don't do anything to earn it or keep it or merit it. It's free. That's why it's called grace. Aren't you glad that God gives second chances? You see, when I admit to him my weakness, when I admit to him that I'm not strong enough, when I admit to him that I can't do it on my own, I love how God gives second chances. Peter got a second chance. And, you know, I know for many in this room, there have been setbacks and failures. and Look, we all have had them. But there's no one in this room likely that went as far as Peter did. He was one of the disciples, okay? He walked on this earth for three and a half years, literally physically looking at, listening to, and touching Jesus Christ. You would think that would have a big impact on a person, right? You know what Peter did at when Jesus was being led away to be crucified? Not only did he deny Jesus three times, he cursed God. He denied ever knowing him, and he completely abandoned him. Now, there are probably some of you in here that maybe you've had, uh, you used to be more engaged than you are. You used to go to church, and I encourage you to get back in, okay? But you probably didn't go as far as Peter. I doubt there are many of you in this room that have said, you know, well, I used to be in, but, you know, by God... Uh, Let's tear the church down. (laughs) Uh, That's that's kind of extreme. And you know what? God gave Peter a second chance. Not only did he give him a second chance, but he, um, he used him. He became the one that preached on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 were saved. God gives second chances. Can I get an amen right there? Lamentations 3, 22 and 23, because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Isaiah 40, 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. 
aren't you glad that God can use your weakness to demonstrate his grace? Here's the second thing. God uses your weakness to help you depend on him. Now, often we don't really get why God does what he does, but he will use our weakness to help us depend on him. Look in uh, Corinthians uh, 2, 3 to 5. It says, I came to you in weakness. This is the Apostle Paul talking. Timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain rather than being clever and persuasive speeches. I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. Formula for success. I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. And then notice the second part, that, that sent next sentence. I did this so that you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. When you and I begin to trust in the power of God rather than our own wisdom, God begins to work on our behalf. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. And then finally, God uses your weakness to develop, develop endurance. I don't know if you know this or not, but life's a marathon. Now, I realize the older you get, the more it seems like a sprint down the hill that you're out of control. Right? Uh, the, the older I get, the faster it seems to go by. When I was little, a, a year, waiting a year for your birthday seemed like it took 10 years. Now, uh, a year from my birthday seems like 10 weeks, right? Okay. But God uses your weakness to develop endurance. Life will pass you by, and you've got to have some endurance. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And, and what does that mean? Well, it means that Yes, you're going to fail, and yes, you're going to fall short, and yes, you're not always going to get it right. But you know what he wants you to do? He wants you to keep on getting up and keeping on keeping on. The Bible says in Proverbs that a righteous man falleth seven times, but he riseth yet again. And you say, well, I fail in your weakness. You can be strong. When you depend on him, you can be strong. A righteous man rises again. Doesn't matter how many times you get knocked out. It matters how many times you get up. And that's what God wants me to know. He wants me to develop endurance. And, and can I just say this by way of personal testimony? I wish I could tell you. And some of you may have had a different experience than, than I have. But I wish I could tell you that the older you get, the easier it is. Now, the older you get, the more ingrained some things become in you, okay? But if you think that after you've just been doing this Christian life thing for a while, that it just gets easier. And e well, it does get easier. You, you know things. But let me tell you something. You're going to get knocked down. I, I wish I could tell you. I've been a Christian since I was eight years old. I'm 59 years old, be 60 years old this calendar year. And I'm here to tell you that it's really easy now. It ain't. <laughs> in fact, in a lot of ways, it's harder. And if you don't develop endurance, you know what you're going to do? You, you may not quit per se. And by that, I mean, you know, you, you'll still show up to church. You'll still have the Christian ease. You'll still have the look. You put on the Sunday face. Everybody thinks you're great. But on the inside, you've quit. Or you've just been discouraged. Or you've thrown in the towel. Or you've given, or, or worse, you've become apathetic. I know a lot of people that have been Christians for a long time, and you know what they've done? They haven't denied God. They're not out, you know, robbing banks and doing all kinds of things like that. You know what they're doing, though? They're not advancing the kingdom of God. We say around here, your next step is your most important step. And you know what's happened to so many Christians? They just quit stepping. They had not taken their next step in a long time. And to me, you know, it's like the old saying that I heard years ago. A guy was talking about success. He said, 
my greatest fear in life is that I will climb to the top of the ladder of success and when I get there, find out that it was leaning against the wrong wall all the time. So what am I saying? I'm saying don't give up. I'm saying engaged. You say, well, I'm retired now. And I'm glad for you. And I hope you make more money in retirement than you did ever when you were working. Okay? And I hope you use your time wisely. And I hope that you have a very, very, very long and prosperous and healthy and happy life. But let me just say this. There is no retirement plan in the Christian life. I'm not talking about from your job. But when it comes to serving God, you know what I learned? The church I grew up in, there were some old women. They had been around. Some of them were in their 90s. And I remember thinking, what do these women do? They go to church every time the doors are open, and they, I get that. But as I got older, I realized what they did. They had stepped into a prayer ministry. They had stepped into praying. They had a mantle for prayer on them that most likely they were doing more in the latter days of their life than they'd ever done before. What am I saying? God's got something for you to do. And it doesn't involve just sitting on the sideline. He wants you to be in the game. Well, 1 Corinthians, I'll end with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And there are several verses I want to read. This is about Paul talking about our weakness. He said, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the power of God. God's message of the cross, that's the power. He said, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. In some translations, it reads this way, the foolishness of preaching. He doesn't mean foolish preaching as in that that makes no sense or that's wrong. He's talking about what people look at and they say, you mean you believe that? You mean you live, we have science now. Haven't you watched anything on YouTube lately? The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. What's God saying to you? He's saying that when you're weak, you're strong. Not weak in your sin, but weak because you can't, Do it on your own. You understand that. You understand that your strength comes not from your failure, but from your dependence on him. And when you get that, Katie, bar the door. I don't even know what that means, but I like saying it. Look out. It's getting ready to change. Remember, we're talking about the power for change. How do you get it? When you're weak, when you depend on him, when you admit that you can't do it without him, when you're not trusting in your own intelligence, your own wisdom, your own strength, your own strategy, your own plan, when you don't do that but you trust him, then you are strong. And my prayer is that God makes every one of us strong. Heavenly Father, help us to depend on you. Help us to admit that we're not strong. But admitting that we need your help, that we must trust in you, then we become immovable. We become solid with a foundation that cannot be shaken. 
Well, there are so many people that their foundation has been shaken in this culture. And it's because they're putting their trust in the wrong things themselves. This world's philosophy. But Lord, when we trust in you, that will never be defeated. And help us to get that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.